So hello everybody, good morning. Welcome to the class. This is British and European uh, cultural history. Um, welcome back to university. Welcome to university actually, if that's the uh, uh, case for you. So as I mentioned, um, there is the video for the um, first class, such as it was, that riveting video of me going through the syllabus. <laughs> so please pay attention to that and also revisit the syllabus so you get a sense of the expectations for the class and the grading. Here we're gonna plunge straight into the content of the course, looking at revolutions and paradigms in a uh, global context. I guess you could say this is a broad beginning to what is necessarily a broad class because it is British and European cultural history which encompasses a tremendous amount of stuff. So as I said on the uh, syllabus, this is necessarily going to be selective. It's my name, uh, Gregory. Today's and next week's itineraries, because we're gonna be going through um, both of these over the course of the uh, following two weeks. Today we're thinking about the prehistory of Britain. By prehistory, we mean everything that happened uh, before the year uh, um, 600 BC. So that's before 2600 uh, years ago, because that basically refers to um, the prehistory of Britain. And when we say prehistory, we typically mean uh, prior to recorded history. So that's before people were writing things um, down. So you see there, um, just to get this out of the way, there's uh, terminology involved here, uh, BC, means before Christ and is sometimes replaced by BCE, before the Common Era, just as AD is sometimes replaced by CE, the Common Era. Um, the replacement is to remove the religious connotations, but it's still the same calendar. We haven't actually had a revolution about that, so I use them uh, interchangeably just to uh, tell you about that. Um, global revolutions in the human condition. Say Britain was this, at the center of the Industrial Revolution and has been closely involved in the Digital Revolution. Um, those are two major transformative developments in human behavior that are relatively uh, recent. But what about the two prehistorical revolutions, Cognitive Revolution and the Agricultural Revolution? That's what we're going to be discussing today. And also on the itinerary, a uh, very condensed history of Britain and also a history of shifting intellectual and material uh, paradigms that will be for uh, next week. So we're going to start today with um, British uh, prehistory. Mentioned before that Britain is serving as something of a case study in the class because it is effectively about European cultural history, but it's uh, filtered through the lens of what happened in uh, Britain of the creation of the British Isles, because they actually were created, interesting point of history, monuments and signs from the prehistoric era and going back and back in time. And just to reiterate the point, this is before people were writing things down, keeping records, at least as far as Britain is concerned. They were writing things down in other places, but not in the British Isles at this point. So difficult to piece together any kind of uh, history. You have to be selective. There's Winston Churchill, a figure who's going to come up um, later as well, perhaps the most renowned person in uh, British history, though not immune to controversy. I think he was voted the number one person in British history in some poll they had. And he famously referred to the British as, quote, an island uh, race with the kind of implications that the fact that uh, Britain is an island or the British islands are islands, if you want to pluralize that, um, the fact that it's an island has been uh, instrumental in its history has had an impact on shaping the cultural identity of the nation. And I would say that that is uh, probably uh, true. It has certainly been a factor in a numerous things. For instance, uh, Britain, the country, has not been uh, successfully invaded since the year 1066, which is almost a thousand years ago now, since there was a successful invasion of the country. Contrast that with many of the countries in uh, Europe, which were invaded repeatedly in the 20th century alone. Why? Because it's an island. It's really hard to invade an island. Not impossible, has been done, but it's a geographical factor that shapes the history of the country. And its separation from the European continent has also been uh, important in the development of the British psyche. I would say it was a factor in something like Brexit, for instance, the idea of Britain as separate from Europe, even though it's obviously a part of the European continent. So there's something to think about um, the way that the uh, just geographical uh, features of the nation have shaped its history just the way that Iceland is an island in the North Atlantic has certainly shaped its history as well. 
Wasn't always the case, though, actually. Britain was actually connected to the mainland of Europe until relatively uh, recently. Then you see a representation of the country connected to the mainland. Became an island uh, roughly 8,000 years ago when huge uh, tsunamis caused a substantial rise in uh, sea levels. We think about um, environmental catastrophe and the kinds of uh, transformative things that can happen just with the natural environment. Well, how about that for something that happened which caused basically an entire uh, change in the structure of this land and shaped the history of the nation. Subsequently, the area that once linked Britain to Europe is known as uh, Doggerland, now buried under uh, sea. We'll take a look at just some uh, flashpoints, checkpoints in British prehistory. We don't have a lot to work with. As I said, no written records. So how are we actually discerning what was happening with uh, people at this time? Well, we have to play the role of grave robbers to an extent, because that's the best place to find uh, records of this earlier history. And there you see a display of the grave of the so-called uh, Amesbury Archer. This was a grave unearthed accidentally in 2002 and belongs to a man who died around the year 2300 BC, so about 4300 years ago. That takes us into the prehistory era of uh, Britain. What were people like during this period? What were they doing at this time thousands of years ago? Well, tough to say, but apparently beaker pots were a big thing within their culture because this fellow was buried with beaker pots. So it's giving some kind of indication that this was a sort of important aspect of their society. We're carrying things, vessels, eating things out of whatever it might be, included as part of the grave goods, and that's it. That's what you can say about this person, the Amesbury Archer. It comes from a beaker pot culture. I think they even named the culture in that way. Something else famously from prehistory in Britain is uh, Stonehenge, which is a prehistoric monument located in Wiltshire, England. It was constructed sometime between 3000 and 2000 BC, so that's in the range of 5,000 to 4,000 years ago. Now a giant tourist trap, which is, I don't think, what the people would have expected at the time. Incredible accomplishment, of course, hauling these giant rocks, these giant stones, and piling them up in this way. These are the remnants of the original uh, structure Structure, and there's, of course, a lot of uh, conversation about what exactly they were using this uh, place for. Had a religious purpose, perhaps. It was a gathering place, probably connected to the solstice in some way or another. But again, we don't know because they didn't tell us. They didn't explain to us the reason why they were building Stonehenge. They constructed it, and subsequent cultures, people who came afterwards, have made use of it in a variety of uh, different ways. You see a painting uh, depicting the Stone Age, um, and this could uh, provide a bit of insight into Britain's uh, prehistory. They are making progress with new technologies involving um, DNA mapping, among other things, which are revealing a lot of interesting details about uh, the past. Here's something interesting about the people from the Stonehenge era. Um, a 2018 study indicates that the inhabitants of Britain who began constructing Stonehenge Stonehenge died off in a short period of time. Now we're used to thinking of these kind of slow, gradual evolutionary changes and transitions for different people, but it can be the case that sometimes people were just wiped out quite quickly, relatively speaking. Why did that happen? Well, again, we can only speculate. No records. We don't know what might have occurred. Um, disease, certainly potential factor. Nothing in the way of medical treatment at the time. A uh, rash of disease can certainly wipe people out quite quickly during this era. Also potentially displacement caused by invaders from what is now the Netherlands. It's another speculative idea. And this would have been part of the uh, trend of history as well. We think about the native inhabitants of Britain, the original inhabitants of Britain. But we need to get away from the idea that for thousands of years there was one ethnic group, one nation occupying the island. No, it would have been a sequence of people, a cycle of people who would have lived there. Those people die out, new people come, or new people invade the island and wipe out the original inhabitants, or they kind of intermingle with one another and become a different group of people. So there would have been a lot of different cultures, a lot of different groups of people that would have inhabited the island during the uh, prehistoric period. And I should also mention something very telling as well. 
um, what percentage of uh, British history, as far as human history is concerned, what percentage of British history involves prehistory? The overwhelming majority of it. Recorded history in Britain accounts for nothing. It's like 1% of the total history of Britain. People have been living there long before there were any records tabulating what they were doing. So there's a very long stretch of history. We don't know a whole lot about it, but it's important to keep that in mind. This is an artist's rendition of a Mesolithic uh, fishing encampment in Britain. Note the usage of tools, bows and arrows, and fire. Such an encampment could have existed anywhere between 7,000 and 17,000 uh, years ago. Usage of uh, tools, rudimentary dwellings, close to waterways as well. That was something people did in the past. We still do that today. Think of all the various uh, places, towns, and cities built on coastlines, their water sources, whether on the seashore or whether on rivers. That was uh, quite deliberate. That's what people were doing in the past for a long time as well. Back and back into the past. How far back into the past? Thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, as the case might be. Back into the days before we were even humans as such. Because this species, of course, is a species that has gone through a long evolutionary cycle of a development. And we did have ancestors who came before us who were not humans as such, but kind of a different type of a species. There you see a reconstruction of archaic predecessor to human beings from roughly 800,000 years ago, you want a sense of what our primordial ancestors might have looked like 800,000 uh, years ago. And these individuals or animals, whatever you want to call them, they may have been in uh, Britain in their own right. There you see an image of one of the Haysborough uh, footprints, which were discovered on a beach in Norfolk, England in 2013, which are over 800,000 years old, making them some of the oldest primate footprints discovered outside of Africa. So that takes us well back into the deep past. Not humans, they're not humans, they're primates, but they're kind of ancestors of us. Interesting point, if those um, beings, those creatures, were in the British Isles, then it gives a sense that the British Islands have been um, involved in the evolutionary development of human history for a very long time, even if Africa was ultimately the nexus for the place of originary human development. So that's Britain with a long history of uh, human habitation and primate habitation. In contrast to some other places, Iceland for instance, human habitation is quite a recent phenomenon as far as this goes. Other places have a much longer history. Now I'm going to speak about this topic of uh, global revolutions because this takes us into the prehistory and also links us to the course as a whole. And I should point out right now that this is just a kind of a selective view of history. It's necessary to be uh, selective and limited because we're dealing with such an enormous amount of uh, time. But this is just one way to uh, think about things, to think about our connection to um, earlier people and also the entire history of uh, British and uh, European culture. What do I mean when I say global revolutions? These are not political, social, economic, or religious revolutions. That's usually what we mean when we speak about a revolution, like the Russian Revolution, calls to mind a change in the uh, politics or the structures of a nation uh, state. These are something else. Um, they can produce changes in politics, society, economic systems, and uh, religious paradigms. When I say one of these global revolutions, I'm referring more to a fundamental change in human behavior. So something that is sort of um, a little bit uh, deeper than uh, something that has to do with these uh, systems and uh, paradigms. Global revolution is a large-scale and potentially worldwide transformation in human behavior, which is generally unintended. I don't think when you look at the history of global revolutions, um, there was ever a sense of people deliberately implementing one of these revolutions. There might have been people who were kind of uh, spearheading them. We'll talk about that when we get to the industrial revolution and the digital revolution. But ultimately, there are these kinds of tidal waves that start sweeping over us. We always like to think we're in uh, control of things, but probably not in many cases. They're just kind of sweeping us along towards a different plane of existence, a different uh, mode of behavior. 
They can encompass the entire human population, but this process is necessarily uh, fragmented and uh, incomplete. Global revolution, you think of things like religious revolutions or political revolutions, those are usually in select locales. You don't necessarily expect them to become these global phenomena, although they could potentially uh, become so. But uh, these kinds of revolutions, they uh, traverse borders and boundaries. They link people together. But the process, as I say, is this kind of fractured process, doesn't necessarily reach completion. And another point, the kind of ethical, moral point, are they uh, good or bad? You would almost think that that's one of the biggest questions when we talk about things like the Industrial Revolution or the Digital Revolution. Who knows? I, I can't tell you if they're good or bad. I mean, it's, it's just one of those open-ended questions. They certainly change things in a big way, but it's hard to come to the conclusion one way or the other as to whether they're really positive or negative. Examples, what am I talking about? Well, here are four uh, of these big global revolutions. I'm sure there are others. As I say, just being uh, selective, just giving a kind of a snapshot here, one way of uh, looking at things. Four major uh, transitions, transformations in human behavior. The cognitive revolution, which I'm going to speak about today, which refers to uh, thinking, the minds of people, commenced in the range of 30,000 to 70,000 uh, years ago. I would say it's the biggest thing that ever happened to us, the biggest thing that ever happened to humanity, the thing that kind of uh, lifted us out of the animal kingdom to an extent. We're still animals to this day, but we're aware of this separation, this division, where we don't really fit into nature anymore. Well, that is thanks to the cognitive revolution, fundamental change in behavior, which turned us into a kind of different type of species. The agricultural revolution, that would have been in the range of 10,000 years ago, had to do primarily with the domestication of other animals and uh, crops, and the growth of uh, cities and towns as well, which didn't really exist as such prior to this uh, period. Moving forward in time, as I said before, there's a lot of other things we could uh, talk about, but here are just some to focus on. The Industrial Revolution, that would be 200 to 250 years ago towards the end of the uh, 1700s. Development of industrial uh, technology, which will be a big subject we'll touch upon later in the class. And the Digital Revolution probably started in the mid-1990s with the advent of the internet, although that's not hard and fast because computers were around uh, before then and uh, still an ongoing thing, digitization, all the kind of computer technology, internet, artificial intelligence, which I think is going to be as big as um, at least two of the previous three ones. We just don't know how big because we're right in the thick of it right now. We're living through this. You might note, too, this is what I mean when I say that they can encompass the population, but they don't necessarily have to, because you can make the point that um, not all people on the Earth, for instance, have experienced the Industrial Revolution. They haven't gone through industrialization. It's a patchwork process, kind of fragmented process. Not only that, but they don't have to go through it. There's nothing that says you have to do this in order for your life to be a particular way. It's just something that can kind of spread across the world. So too, the digital revolution. What percentage of people today have access to the internet, for instance? I think it's over half of the people, but it's not everybody. Not everybody has access to the internet, thus not everybody's experiencing digitization. They could potentially in the future. As I say, we're going to speak about uh, the two prehistorical ones, the two that occur uh, prior to the advent of uh, written history. Starting here with the uh, cognitive revolution, it's also been called the human revolution because this is widely regarded as the um, event, the phenomenon that sort of uh, turned us into to humans as we understand it today, or the upper paleolithic revolution, referring to a uh, time period. We'll stick with the cognitive revolution because I think that captures this idea of having something to do with our minds or uh, thinking. There's been various representations of this moment, one of the most famous from Stanley Kubrick's uh, great film 2001. If you watch the beginning of the film, that is a representation of the dawn of humanity at the time of the cognitive revolution, where you have a bunch of primates running around, acting like animals, and then there's the appearance of this uh, monolith, 
which is obviously a very symmetrical looking object. Looks like something that would be artificially designed. The landscape, the natural landscape, note the background with the craggy rocks in the sky. Landscape usually doesn't produce things that are quite so symmetrical with these neat straight lines and corners. Looks like an artificial construct and appears to trigger this transition, this transformation, where these primates go from behaving like animals to uh, sort of behaving more like people. Kubrick's film, um, I think, is a great film, uh, but you might note a few um, historical inaccuracies in this uh, opening scene, or I just would say Kubrick kind of uh, being a bit loose with history, which is not a fault, it's a film, doesn't necessarily need to be historically accurate, but just a couple of things. The major transition, the major breakthrough for these uh, primates occurs when one of them discovers the use of uh, tools. There's a bunch of bones lying around. One of them discovers that it can pick up one of the tools and use it as a club in order to club other animals or other primates as well. And that's presented as being this really big uh, breakthrough. Uh, was that part of the cognitive revolution, the use of tools? Yes, but not the only thing. I mean, probably our ancestors had been using tools in a kind of basic rudimentary sense anyway. And you could also make the argument that animals use tools to an extent in a kind of basic rudimentary way. So it's not a clean cutoff, a not uh, kind of um, hard and uh, fast uh, distinction. There are a lot of other things involved in this transition, this breakthrough, which I'm going to speak about shortly. The other thing, probably the biggest thing in this depiction in Kubrick's film, is that the primates really do look like primates. They really do look like animals. And that's to sort of emphasize this idea of a transition from the animal uh, kingdom. But that might not necessarily have been the case around the time of the cognitive revolution 50,000 years ago. Because we can ask that uh, question, what did uh, people, what did homo sapiens, humans, look like 50,000 years ago? Always an interesting question to ask. Well, like us, you might be surprised to hear. I mean, probably dirtier and hairier, right? But basically, they look like us. The basic biological makeup, the genetic structure of humans was in place 50,000 years ago and had been for a very long time by that juncture. In order for us to kind of take on this form, I mean, you go back 150,000 years before that kind of transition occurred, which is very interesting. Think about that for a moment. We looked kind of like this, but we weren't thinking in the way that humans think today. We were living as animals, integrated into the ecosystem. Precursors to the cognitive revolution, yes, absolutely. The reason we call this a revolution is because, very interestingly, it seems to have been quite a rapid transition once it began to take place. Now, we're used to thinking about um, evolutionary time in terms of these long, gradual developments. That's what people say when they say evolution, stretching over thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, and even millions of years, and it's this gradual, slow-moving change. That was certainly the case for our uh, ancestors for a long time, except things started to change quite quickly 50,000 years ago. But that's not to say that there was nothing that anticipated this breakthrough previously. For instance, one of the biggest things would have had to have been the uh, mastery of fire, which occurred well before the cognitive revolution. 500,000 years ago, perhaps up to a uh, million years ago, when our ancestors discovered not just the use and value of fire, Fire, because fire, of course, is destructive, it's dangerous, but uh, we, like other animals, are kind of aware of its use value as well, not just discovering its usefulness, but also discovering how to kind of take control of it and use it for our own purposes and ends. And as Stephen Pine writes, this transition turned these primates into fire creatures from an ice age. I like that as a description because our ancestors were nurtured during an ice age, still in an ice age right now, but they became these creatures who were defined in part through their mastery and usage of fire, which separated them from other animals. Other animals can kind of use fire to an extent, not the way we do, not with the same kind of level of control and manipulation that we have over it. So if we're going back uh, this amount of time, then we'd be aware that uh, this mastery of fire would have occurred before we were humans as such. Indeed, before we were even biologically humans. There you see a reconstruction of the face of a female Homo erectus, uh, one of the uh, predecessors 
to uh, Homo sapiens. And you can see, kind of looking human, you know, definitely a different species, but nonetheless sort of looking uh, more similar to us. Species that was a precursor to humanity that lived between 2 million and 100,000 uh, uh, years ago. The mastery of fire would have produced far-ranging uh, consequences, including the diversification of uh, their diets. Now, there would have been other consequences as well. Fire, for instance, uh, very helpful for warding off other animals, perhaps predators. Most animals are wary around the presence of fire, so if you build a big uh, fire campsite, it could keep other animals away. Also, for artificially extending daylight as well, would have been very significant to our ancient ancestors. We're daytime animals. We're active during the day. We sleep at night. Some animals are nocturnal. They're more active at night. But we are basically defined by our daytime activities. So with the mastery of fire, it allows you to kind of seize control of light a little bit and thus extends the hours in which you're active and probably would have produced a big uh, impact. You can think about that today. Living in a place like Iceland, right, during the winter, very important to have control over the use of light, right? Otherwise, nobody would live here. It's too damn dark. So something that would have been significant. But I think the difference to diet would have been the most important thing, the ability to cook food. That would have been something that would have made uh, all the difference to the people who came uh, before us. The latter development may have allowed them to process ideas rather than herbage. I'll get into that in a little bit. There's been a lot of talk about uh, what exactly our ancestors were eating. And it's unfortunately, I would say, become couched in contemporary political debate. Meat, in particular, has become one of the um, talking points there, with some people claiming that the uh, cooking of raw meat was absolutely instrumental to these early developments, and other people claiming, no, it actually wasn't that important. It was other foods that we were eating, as I say, kind of wrapped up in modern political debates. But I would say that probably both sides um, miss the key point. It was the diversification of our diets in general. The fact that we could eat a lot more stuff, it made us much more versatile in terms of the nutrition that we could take in. Yes, meat might have played a role in that, but other foods as well. Think about some of the foods today that are um, not just part of uh, human diets, but are absolutely staple crops, essential. Potatoes, rice, wheat, things like that. You ever tried to eat a raw potato? I guess you could, but you wouldn't want to. You ever tried to eat raw rice? No, we cooked those things. And they wouldn't have been a part of our diet prior to the mastery of fire. So these essential things were bringing these changes and transitions, diversify the diet of a species, and suddenly the species itself is a lot more versatile in terms of what it can accomplish. Processing ideas rather than herbage. I like that idea because that's really what most animals are focused on is processing herbage, getting enough nutrients, getting enough food for the purposes of a survival. But suddenly we had uh, probably more food than we'd ever had at a previous point in time, and that would have uh, triggered new levels of uh, brain uh, development, which probably would have paved the way for the cognitive revolution because suddenly our brains were developed to the point where we were capable of making this a larger transition. In evolutionary terms, strictly evolutionary terms, a large brain is uh, not necessarily a good thing. Why not? Because it is a massive drain on energy and resources. I mean, so much of our energy and resources, it's just going to feed our brains right now because it's soaking up most of the energy. So you have to keep feeding the beast. Animals, of course, dealing with survival, they don't necessarily want something that's a huge drain on their energy. But if you reach a certain point where you have enough food where you can keep that going, well, the brain starts to develop and evolve, strengthen over time until it becomes uh, the most important factor in our development. We're used to thinking of Homo sapiens humans as this very uh, singular branch, uh, which it is today. I mean, we're aware of ourselves as this kind of separate species, um, certainly irrevocably distinct from other animals, although we often struggle to say in uh, what way. We are animals, but nonetheless very much different. Um, but we're not totally singular because there was, it seems, another branch of species that was quite similar uh, to us, and this would have been the famous uh, Neanderthals, which uh, went extinct about 30,000 
years ago. There you see a reconstruction of a Neanderthal child from uh, Europe. Nope, looks kind of human as well. They were actually a kind of different species, although there's a lot of debate as to um, how uh, different they were. Say there, there's a lot of different uh, controversy about the Neanderthals and the extent to which they experienced anything like the cognitive revolution or were basically living as animals throughout their entire um, lifespan question of whether they had advanced uh, language skills, and also, intriguing question, of how exactly they all died out. They didn't survive, that much is uh, clear. The Neanderthals are kaput. Um, was it because they were simply displaced by Homo sapiens or intermingled with them? Or did Homo sapiens, humans, did they kill off all the Neanderthals, which they might have done? Don't know, can't say. Again, too far back in the past, certainly weren't keeping records of what was happening at the time. It's just clear that once uh, humans reached a certain level of development, they basically took over the planet and Neanderthals ended up being uh, sidelined in uh, history. Talk about these things, biological development of humans and the cognitive um, revolution. And here's one of those um, statistics or uh, facts, details that has been given a lot of uh, play and has received a lot of uh, interest showing our uh, similarity to the animal kingdom. Studies have indicated that humans share about 99% of their DNA with chimpanzees, which is a number that's often cited to give that sense of our close connection to um, creatures that we are um, uh, linked to in uh, the past and even in uh, the present. But I say there, the number, um, the importance of this number might be uh, slightly overblown because I think that number is often used to give this indication that we're really quite close to other animals and that whatever we're doing that separates us, that distinguishes us, is um, not that big of a difference. It's only something like 1% difference. Other than that, we're just behaving like animals and there's this kind of little incremental distinction there. But um, I'm not sure if that's really true because I think that this number is um, a lot uh, less significant than um, a kind of parallel statistic, which is that uh, we share 100% of our DNA with a, another animal species, namely us, humans. And I mentioned this point uh, previously. With the biological structure, the makeup of humans being in place already 50,000 years ago and having been in place probably from the time that uh, stretches back 150,000 years, it uh, leads to a very uh, important point to consider is that the, for the majority of our lifespan as a species, we have lived as animals. That has been our state of being for the majority of our lifespan as species. It's a kind of somewhat recent development for us to be living as uh, humans. Now, of course, that uh, leads into all sorts of interesting questions about um, all of our uh, talk about higher ideals and morality and uh, ethics, it kind of gives an indication that probably brute instincts and animal instincts are playing a very large role in the decisions that we make and the inclinations and desires that we have. We've just kind of layered them on with all this stuff with uh, civilization. So that's definitely something to take, um, take into account. But also kind of, I would say, um, it gives the sense that whatever the cognitive revolution was, whatever the transition was, it was something that was kind of immaterial. It wasn't a kind of a change in the strictly physical sense, but rather a change in our behavior or a change in our uh, thinking that occurred after all these biological developments had already taken place. So interesting to think about, and also interesting to think about the possibility of other animals experiencing something similar. Now, presumably, you'd have to have that kind of biological foundation in place. I don't think cockroaches are going to develop higher reasoning skills anytime soon. We have intelligent animals like elephants and dolphins. Assuming they survive long enough, could they too experience something like the cognitive revolution? Interesting question. 
So what was it then? What were some of the signs and symptoms of this breakthrough, this development? Well, here we go with signs of the uh, cognitive revolution and bring this back to the point of uh, tools that I brought up uh, previously. Slow moving, gradual evolutionary changes stretching over thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. You have things emerging beforehand, the mastery of fire, probably the formation of uh, familial units as well, uh, mother, father, uh, child. That probably would have happened prior to 50,000 years ago in a kind of uh, basic uh, sense. And a few other things as well that I'll get into. But it was really in the range of 50,000 years ago over a reasonably short period of time that we started doing things that no animals had ever done before or have ever done uh, since. And it was, I say, a sea change encompassing these different things. Development of complex tools, including ornamentation, blades, bows and arrows, needles, oils and oil and oil lamps. So there had been a kind of basic use of tools previously, but this was something quite different. We were using tools to construct other tools and quite fine specific tools as well. Needles, for instance, instrumental in the construction of clothing, which expanded our uh, habitats, oil lamps for the use of taking fire with us, so to speak blades and bows and arrows, greatly increasing our capacity to hunt and to be these kinds of um, apex predators. Another sign of this, again, in the range of 50,000 years ago, 30 to 70,000 years if you want to give a, a range, rapid migration and the transportation of resources and animals over uh, large distances, including to the uh, continent of Australia. Animals migrate, they spread themselves over different areas and habitats, that's just a natural thing to do. That's what our ancestors were doing for a long time. But we weren't migrating in this way, where you have this idea where you're taking stuff with you as you go, taking other animals with you as you go, building uh, seaworthy vessels, rafts, things like that. That's what they started doing at this time. Continent of Australia, uninhabited, by humans or by our ancestors until 50,000 years ago. There are no people there at that time. Plenty of animals, but no people. We never ventured that far. But subsequently, after the cognitive revolution, we started showing up everywhere. All of the continents, just spreading ourselves out across the world. Representational art, here's an example of that. These uh, cave drawings located in southern France are thought to have been created between 20,000 and 30,000 uh, years ago from the time of the cognitive revolution. And you can see these basic drawings, these etchings of animal heads. Representational art basically refers to uh, sketching, drawing something that exists within your environment. So it's recognizable that they're taking something in their space and they're depicting it. Animals, you could say, have their own version of artwork, right? I mean, if you have a cat, your cat probably scratches things, and it leaves these little etchings on the surface, right? Neat, symmetrical little rows. The cat's doing that deliberately. It's claiming it as its own, but it's not really depicting something in its space. It's a kind of basic thing, whereas our ancestors really began depicting things that existed in our space. Incidentally, you can actually train uh, some animals to do very basic representational art. You can train an elephant, for instance, to do a very basic painting of an elephant. Holds the uh, paintbrush in his trunk, does actually a pretty respectable uh, drawing of an elephant. But of course, the question is, does the elephant grasp on any level that is doing a painting of itself? Or is it just this kind of rote learning thing where it's just kind of going through the uh, motions? Interesting question. So take a look at the rest of these. Let's take the break right now. We'll come back in 10 minutes and look at the rest of the signs of the cognitive revolution.